I'm going to be short on details this morning. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what is finance. And I'm going to, I know we're behind, so I'm going to try to try to be brief. I'm starting my nerd runner's watch and try to keep it under, say, 10 minutes or so. Can you hear me? Only when I hold this up, right? Okay. Um, go ahead, Sam. And I'll, give, I'll be giving signals to Sam to, uh, to move the slide. Okay. There is a lot to finance. And today we're going to break it into three subsets, corporate finance, investments, and banking, both commercial and investment banking. Go ahead, Sam. I know you have, most of you haven't had any business courses yet, and you may not know what financial statements are. You may not know what a balance sheet is, but I'm going to use the balance sheet to talk about corporate finance. A balance sheet is a financial statement produced by accountants and used by lots of people, including finance people. And on the left side of that balance sheet, we have assets. We have the things that corporations own and they use to uh, make goods uh, and produce services and sell those in an effort to make profit, to make money for their investors. Now, on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, we have the assets, the things. Now, the left-hand side of the balance sheet is a result of the firm's investment decisions. And we call that capital budgeting. Next slide. I want to give you just a few examples of capital budgeting decisions. Say you work for FedEx or you work for Delta and you have to choose airplanes to buy. You may say, well, maybe should we buy this airplane from Boeing or should we buy that airplane from Airbus? You say, well, one's less, they both do the job. One's less expensive. Oh, that's a good thing. But maybe the other one costs less to maintain and operate over time. Ooh, we've got a trade-off. Throw into that that maybe one has a longer uh, useful life than the other one. Finance people have to make those trade-offs. This is called capital budgeting. Another example, should we introduce this new product? One of my former students worked for Procter & Gamble for many years, and one of his big things was other people in the company would produce a product, and he would have to assess, not in isolation, working with marketing people and other people, he'd have to assess, does it make sense to introduce this product? If we introduce this product, are we going to be creating wealth? Are we going to be creating wealth for our shareholders, or are we going to be destroying wealth? If so, we're not going to introduce it. Should we build this component or buy it? Another financial decision? Almost every business decision has financial consequences and requires finance people to assess those consequences. Now, let me, let me take this opportunity to say that I think finance is a good major, but I think every, certainly every major in the business college is good for some people. This is, what we do is important, but it's no more important than what the accountants do, the, the various management majors, and the marketing people. You know, I'm not up here to sell finance. I'm just up here to give you a feel for it as much as I can in the few minutes that I have. Okay, next slide. Let's take a look. Go ahead and hit it again, Sam. Okay. Let's take a look at the right-hand side of the balance sheet. What are the things that companies use to produce goods and services? Let's start from, literally from the ground up. Real estate buildings, plants, office buildings, equipment, machinery, inventory. They have to finance those things. Those things aren't free. So investors provide the money for those things. And uh, <clears throat> the right-hand side of the balance sheet represents the firm's financing decisions. How did they choose to finance those assets? These are just some examples of, fin of corporate financing decisions. Firms raise money to obtain assets by issuing stock, that is equity and bonds, debt. And by the way, I'm going to talk very, very, very briefly about investment banking. Investment bankers facilitate. They stand as intermediaries between corporations and investors and assist them in issuing both stocks and bonds. Okay, so we have to decide how much debt are we going to have and how much equity. This is a, this is a difficult decision. I don't have time to explain this, but debt is cheaper to a company than equity. So you might say, well, gee, why don't you just always issue debt? The problem is that debt makes a company riskier through something called leverage. So as debt makes the company riskier, as debt makes the company riskier, both the debt and the equity become more expensive. So you've got a trade-off. You want to use that cheap debt, but if you use it too much, you make your cost of financing the real estate, the buildings, 
the inventory, you make it too expensive. Finance people have to figure this out. Okay, how much of our debt should be long-term versus short-term? Actually, lots of decisions involved in that. Do we borrow from a bank? Do we issue bonds? <clears throat> if we issue bonds, what, what does that bond contract look like? There are bonds that can be converted into common stock. There are bonds that can be bought back at a pre-specified price called callable bonds. Lots of decisions. This is a big issue. How much does it cost a company to raise money? If you go to any company that knows what it's doing, you go to the top finance people and you say, what's your cost of capital? What's your weighted average cost of capital? They should be able to tell you, well, right now, it's a guess, right? Like a lot of things in finance, it's a guess, but they should be able to tell you, well, our cost of capital is 11.2%, or our cost of capital is 14.7%. Why is that important? Because this firm is making investments. Remember, they're taking on projects. They're, they're, they're selling toothpaste or they're selling insurance, and their projects have to earn more than their cost of capital. If it costs a company 15%, to raise a dollar of, of capital, capital is just another word for money, if it costs a company 15% to raise money and their investments are earning on average 13%, that, that company is going to do very poorly. So this is a very important number. Okay, Sam. And of course we have to decide how much to pay out in dividends. When companies do make profits, they can do two things with those profits. They can reinvest them in the, into themselves and back into the company in the name of the shareholders or they can pay it out as cash. That's a decision that has to be made. Ooh, running a little bit behind. Uh, okay, we've talked about corporate finance to the extent we're going to today. Let's talk a little bit about investments and what type of things do we study when we study investments. What methods do investors use to try, use to, try to pick good investments? You know, how do people, when somebody says, hey, I, IBM's a great buy right now, or Microsoft's a, you know, oh, it's overpriced. How do we determine that? That's one of the things we study, and we call that active management. Another thing we talk about a lot in finance is how easy is it to determine whether IBM or Ford Motor Company or General Electric or any of those companies is a good buy right now. Turns out it's not as easy as you might think. It's certainly not nearly as easy as television commercials would have you believe. How should investors optimally split their money across investments and asset classes? This is a big issue. You haven't dealt with it yet, but your parents certainly have. Your parents are in the process of creating wealth, creating lifetime wealth, and you will soon be, well, okay, a few years from now, you will be creating lifetime wealth. You will have some discretionary money that you will want to invest. How do you invest it optimally? We call that portfolio theory, and that's an important part of the study of investments. Derivatives has become a dirty word for a lot of people. You know, derivatives get us into trouble sometimes. And people will, some people, if someone says to you, oh, derivatives, we just don't ever deal with those because they're dangerous and they're risky and they're bad. Those people don't understand derivatives. Derivatives can be very simple and they can be used very effectively to reduce risk. Okay, so derivatives can be very simple or they can be extremely complex or anywhere in between. We study derivatives as finance majors. Banking, I'm not going to say a lot about this. Commercial banks basically take deposits from, from people and they make loans. They make loans to individuals and they also make loans to businesses. Uh, let's, another one, investment banks. There is a whole lot to investment banking. Usually, for those people who think about investment banks, when they talk about investment banking, the thing, the thing they think about is issuing securities. Remember, these companies have to issue equity, they have to issue debt, and uh, they are almost always assisted by investment banks. That's a big thing that investment banks do. But investment banks do a whole lot of other things. They do a lot of advising. They do a lot of advising on mergers and acquisitions, on capital structure. Uh, they're involved with trading securities. They often have groups that manage money, et cetera. So there's a whole lot to investment banking. Okay. Um, I want to just show you a couple of pictures, uh, talk about some things that we would talk about in um, finance classes. And let's take a look at this. This is a hedge fund. And you may or may not be familiar with it. It was some time ago in the 1990s called Long-Term Capital Management. And Long-Term Capital Management was able to turn $1 of investment into $4 of value in four and a half years. If you don't realize it, that's a really good return. 
And look, it doesn't look all that risky either, right? It's not very volatile. That $1 has been growing very steadily. Finance majors find this very interesting. But what we find more interesting is what happened after this. How was long-term capital management able to destroy so much value so quickly? We'd like to study this so that, so that we don't make this type of mistake and so that we avoid investing our money with companies that are doing what long-term capital management did. We find pictures like this very interesting. Go ahead. Um, AIG was at one time America's largest insurance company. They had over 100,000 employees. One office in London that had about 40 employees was able to, kind of like long-term capital management, destroy all of AIG's value. Is AIG still around? Yeah, they are. Why? Because the United States government bailed them out. Otherwise, they should have gone out of business. One office in London destroyed all their value. How could that happen? That's something we'd like to know. That's something we'd like to understand. It's something we study as finance majors. And uh, the answer is, that's the downside of not understanding derivatives. Okay. Um, we talk about the credit crunch and how it led to uh, our current economic condi conditions. Does anybody recognize this guy? Can I see a hand? I know I can't see you very well. Somebody in the front row. Warren Buffett. And the question is, who is this man and why should we care? We should care because... Sam? As of last September, Forbes magazine listed him as America's second wealthiest person. How did he become wealthy? By investing. And by investing other people's money. So he's been probably the world's, certainly the United States best investor over the last half century, over the last 50 years. So we think he's interesting. We want to know what he does and, and how he does it. Uh, where do finance majors go? They go everywhere. Um, in any typical year, we send finance majors to 70 or 80 different uh, companies. And notice, um, so many of them go to consulting firms. Those consulting firms consult primarily in corporate finance, but also some of the investment banking issues and also some investments. And you can see some names here of companies uh, where, where our former graduates have gone. Okay, bottom line, finance is a good major for some. Okay. There are many good majors. Picking the right major is all about finding a good match for you. And I do want to emphasize what um, Professor Middlestadt said. Once you choose a major... You know, it's not set in stone for the rest of your life that you're going to be an accountant, you're going to be a finance person. I was a math undergrad, and I decided somewhere along the line that I liked finance a lot more than I liked pure math. I get to use some math in finance, but it's really applied, which is more, much more fun for me. Okay. So what questions should you ask yourself? Are you generally comfortable with numbers? You don't have to be a rocket scientist by any means to be a finance major, but if, but if a... But if an equation scares you, if a page of numbers scares you, that's probably not a good sign. Do you enjoy solving problems by thinking analytically? And something else that Professor Middlestadt said, you are not going to be working in a vacuum. You're going to be working with accountants. You're going to be working with other people in your business. So don't think finance is not all about being, it's certainly not about being a quant nerd. That's not what it's about. Uh, do you enjoy solving problems by thinking analytically? Are you able to live with some uncertainty? Finance is all about making educated guesses. When, when somebody says, yeah, let's introduce this product, they're guessing, right? When somebody, says, when somebody calculates the value of, of Microsoft Common Stock and they say, oh, it's $5 undervalued, they're guessing. So when you're dealing with finance, you're dealing with uncertainty. So um, welcome back from your break. And uh, I hope you have a great year.